Hello radio enthusiasts, welcome to another video about early radio from the Roaring Twenties Antique Radio Museum. In this video we will be showcasing the evolution of regulations that control the airwaves today. Regulation of the airwaves started far earlier than most people believe it did. It may come as a surprise to you that the governments of the world began their discussions of wireless communication regulations in Berlin, Germany, way back in 1903, with a conference on wireless telegraphy. The conference was to prepare for the first International Radio Telegraph Convention, which would take place three years later in 1906. The purpose of the convention was to set worldwide standards for radio telegraphy communication. And it was at this convention that the first recommendation that all radio stations be licensed was proposed. In 1904, President Theodore Roosevelt appointed a board, which had a ridiculously long name, to consider rules for the development of radio services. It was commonly referred to as the Roosevelt Board. That board proposed giving oversight of the government radio to the Navy Department, while putting many restrictions on commercial stations. These early attempts at regulation of the airways were mainly for the benefit of government wireless communications, but they also involved commerce. Regulations for ship-to-shore and ship-to-ship -ship communications were established, and ships signaling for help were given top priority. It wasn't until the 1906 International Wireless Telegraph Convention that international rules were agreed to. The rules were to take effect in 1908, and although the United States was a signatory to the agreement, the U.S. Senate did not ratify the agreement until 1912. The United States did pass some regulations before that with the 1910 Ship Act. All larger ships visiting U.S. ports were required to install radio equipment by July 1, 1911. Enforcement of the new law was delegated to the Bureau of Navigation in the Department of Commerce. The Bureau of Navigation would be responsible for regulating radio until 1927. The most infamous disaster at sea occurred on April 4, 1912 at 11.40 p.m. A ship named the Californian was traveling through the North Atlantic and spotted sea ice. Warnings of ice in the area were sent out by the ship beginning at 7 o'clock that evening. The signal was so strong that it interfered with a nearby ship's regular communication. That nearby ship's radio operator only reply was, Shut up, shut up, I'm busy. The Californian continued to send out warnings until 11.30 p.m., at which time the ship's radio operator retired for the night. Ten minutes later, at 11.40 p.m., the nearby ship hit an iceberg. The Titanic was sinking. The sinking ship's radio operator, Jack Phillips, furiously sent out distress calls repeatedly, but since the sinking was at night, most other ships would never hear the call for help. Their radio operators were asleep in their bunks. By sheer luck, one ship's radio operator was still on duty, Harold Cottam. Cottam was the radio operator on the ship Carpathia. The Carpathia immediately changed course and headed for the Titanic at full speed. Sadly, the Carpathia was four hours away from Titanic's position. By the time it arrived, the Titanic had slipped below the waves of the North Atlantic. Because of a lack of proper radio regulations and procedures, over 1,500 of the Titanic's 2,240 passengers died that night. The Titanic sinking sparked a call for new regulations and rules. The International Radio Telegraphic Convention of London held in July of 1912 would agree to new radio regulations and an agreement was signed on July 5th of that year. The San Francisco Call newspaper carried an opinion piece called to check wireless anarchy on July 12th of 1912. Writing of Congresses and recent international radio telegraphic conventions intent to clean up the mess that the airwaves had become. On August 13th of that year, President Taft signed the Act to Regulate Radio Communications that required most radio transmitters to be licensed. By the end of June 1915, there were 1,950 transmitters licensed in the United States. The total included government stations, ship stations, and amateur stations. There were probably many more unlicensed ones. 
Station KDKA in Pittsburgh had their license issued by the Bureau of Navigation Division of the Department of Commerce on October 27, 1920. The call signs issued by the government to the station included the letters KDA, which were previously reserved for ship stations in the Atlantic Ocean, the Gulf of Mexico, and land stations on the Pacific Coast. Amateur station call signs were issued with three characters. The first was a number representing the radio inspection district. In New England, all amateur station call signs started with the number one. In California, all amateur station call signs began with the number six. There were four national radio conferences each year beginning in 1922. By 1926, radio was in chaos and something had to be done. The following year, the 1927 Radio Act was passed. The new law regulated all radio transmissions, foreign and domestic, within the United States under the new Federal Radio Commission. The commission was led by a five-member board appointed by the President and confirmed by the Senate. The commission finally brought order to the nation's radio ways with rules and regulations that ended the Wild West days of radio. Congress passed another bill entitled the Communications Act of 1934. The new law brought together all control of radio, telephone, and telegraph and reformed the Federal Radio Commission into the Federal Communications Commission, commonly referred to as the FCC. Many more changes to the rules and regulations have been added since the FCC was formed, and they continue to change as the way the world communicates continues to change. That's it for this video. There will be more to come as we continue to investigate the early history of the world's first mass medium, radio. Thanks for watching.